To become a champion, I thought you had to be vicious, cruel, and mean. I wanted to be a tough guy. I psyched myself and other people too. In them days, we didn't know about psyching, but I was doing it without realizing it, and it worked for me. Jake LaMotta was born in New York City on July 10, 1922. His father Joe came from Messina, a region that was considered to be the less cultured area of southern Italy. Joe sold fruits and vegetables from a cart, eventually becoming disenchanted by his lot in life, and the family was mired in poverty. LaMotta joked that his dad, quote, went out on the porch one Christmas Eve, fired a shot, and came back in the house and told us kids that Santa had just committed suicide. Jake suffered beatings both at home and at school. One day after being bullied, he came home crying to his father, who slapped him across the face, then handed him an ice pick. Lamada then became the terror at the schoolyard. It was the first time I can remember really having someone afraid of me, Lamada said. I can still remember that feeling of power flooding through me. By the age of eight, his father forced him to fight for coins in the back rooms of bars. Father Joe took most of the earnings, and Jake hated him for it. At the age of ten, LaMotta embraced a life of crime on New York's Lower East Side. It was the kind of place where you steal to survive, he said. He stole hubcaps at first, then copper wiring and typewriters. Once he stole a violin. As he grew older, he graduated to muggings following unsuspecting victims into alleys before hitting them over the head with a lead pipe and stealing their belongings. LaMotta threw a hatchet at a policeman who caught him in the act of burglary. The teenage LaMotta was sent to reform school, but the experience only worsened his mindset. He met his old friend Rocky Graziano inside who told him to stay quiet and do his time, but LaMotta refused. He tried to escape hiding in the back of a truck leaving the jail, but he would get caught and be sent to solitary confinement. Once inside the small cell, LaMotta pounded his fists on the walls, screaming as his curses echoed in the darkness. The prison chaplain took him out of the hole and introduced him to the boxing program. After months of training, LaMotta challenged the prison champion, viciously knocking him out in front of the jailhouse crowd. Upon his release, LaMotta continued to box. He fought in abandoned warehouses for nickels and dimes before making his way to the Teasdale Athletic Club. Now entering officially sanctioned contests, he would win four amateur fights and the Diamond Belt Light Heavyweight title. World War II was now underway, but LaMotta was rejected for military service because of an ear perforation he suffered during a childhood operation which affected his hearing. LaMotta decided to turn to professional boxing in 1941. He fought initially as a southpaw, but switched to an orthodox stance early on in his career. A few friends tried to set him up with some mob figures, but LaMotta didn't want anything to do with them, not trusting them or anyone else. He earned his reputation as a tough guy in his first year as a pro, facing 21-fight veteran Jimmy Reeves. Fans wondered what was keeping him up as Reeves uncorked 30 unanswered punches straight to his jaw. LaMotta refused to fall, but his opponent did, collapsing from the exhaustion of hitting LaMotta round after round. Reeves fell eight times in rounds nine and ten when the bell saved him from a certain knockout, but Reeves was declared the winner and the crowd began to riot. A month later, LaMotta rematched Reeves and this time the veteran paced himself better and won the decision. But it was LaMotta that the fans in Cleveland wanted to see more of. LaMotta faced the undefeated Jimmy Edgar in August of 1942. Edgar, trained by future legend Eddie Futch, made a great fight with LaMotta. The two fought like enraged bulls, Murray Lewin wrote. Don Dumphy said it was one of the four best fights I've ever broadcast. LaMotta won a decision. 
boxing writers began to see him as another Harry Greb, a cocky fighter with an aggressive style. Sugar Ray Robinson began hearing of the exploits of the man who was dubbed the Bronx Bull. Robinson wanted a match with Lamada, but his manager, George Gainsford, didn't like the idea. Sugar Ray overruled him and the bout was made in October of 1942. Lamada was awkward, but Robinson smoothly outboxed the man one writer described as, quote, a human truck. Lamada blamed the loss on the fact that he had to shrink all the way down to 157 pounds, using that as the explanation as to why he didn't have his usual late round kick. Lamada would regroup in January of 1943. He would once again defeat Jimmy Edgar by split decision in Detroit, a city that became his adopted hometown. Lamada had a willingness to face black fighters on their home turf, earning respect and becoming a fan favorite because of his style. In February of 1943, Lamada faced Robinson for the second time. Lamada came in as a 3-1 underdog but changed his strategy ever so slightly, focusing his attack on Sugar Ray's body. Sometimes he would aim for the head but stop when his cornerman whistled out to let him know that he needed to go back to the body. Robinson winced from Lamada's body attack throughout until finally in the eighth round, Robinson was knocked through the ropes. Lamada won the decision, handing the 40-0 Robinson his first professional loss. The New York Times reported, quote, end of Robinson's string shocks the world, while the Detroit Press printed, quote, Jake is city's Cinderella. The two fought again weeks later. Lamada was upset that Robinson was getting so much pro-patriotic press. Robinson was scheduled to enter the army the following week as Private Walker Smith. This go-around, it was Robinson who changed his strategy. He held whenever Lamada got too close, avoiding the ropes. Lamada floored Robinson in the seventh, with Sugar Ray falling hard, and Lamada's corner didn't think he would get up. But Robinson arose at the count of eight and showed his great recuperative powers, fighting on as if nothing happened. After 10 rounds, Robinson was declared the winner to a cacophony of boos. Lamada accepted the loss, but also thought that his own lack of military service hurt him. Fellow fighter Jackie Wilson was introduced before their bout as Sergeant Jackie Wilson, and Lamada thought that the patriotic fervor showed by the fans swayed the judges in Robinson's favor. Days later, Lamada made his discontent official. I didn't lose it, Lamada said. He got the decision. In June of 1943, Lamada faced Fritzy Civic in Pittsburgh with over 15,000 fans on hand. Lamada, a 7-5 favorite, took the decision, but Civic was declared the winner by all the sports writers and ringsiders. They rematched. This time the bout was scheduled for 15 rounds, and critics believed it would be more of the same. Civic laughed, saying that he was only getting better with age. He would be correct as he would take a 15-round split decision. The two fought again four months later, with Lamada coming out on top over 10 rounds. Civic won the early rounds, but Lamada closed fast and won by a nose. The two fought their fourth and final battle in January of 1944. Lamada hurt Civic in the 7th and 8th, almost stopping him late before winning a decision. These victories had fans and writers thinking that Lamada was indeed the best middleweight in the world. But his fourth meeting with Robinson on February 23, 1945, ended with a clear-cut decision win for Sugar Ray. The scorecard now made it three wins for Robinson and one for Lamada. Lamada then defeated the other Sugar in March of 1945, stopping George Sugar Costner in six rounds. Wins over Burt Lytell, Tommy Bell, and an impressive stoppage over Jose Pessora led to Lamada facing Robinson for the fifth time on September 26, 1945. Writer Pat Purcell thought Lamada won, but it was close, stating that Sugar Ray stole some rounds with 10-second rallies at the end of each stanza. The flurries were designed to nail that last impression, Purcell wrote. Evidently, they did. The crowd of 15,000 booed the decision, because Robinson chose to fight cautiously in the last three rounds. Lamada brushed off the loss, going on to decision Holman Williams and stopping the murderous punching Bob Satterfield. Still, no title shot was forthcoming, as Tony Zale held the middleweight belt, but he was serving in the war. Zale returned in 1946 and chose to defend his belt against Rocky Graziano 
instead of LaMotta. Meanwhile, LaMotta's personal life took a dramatic turn when he met teenage beauty Beverly Rosalind Thaler, who preferred to be called Vicky because it sounded sexier. She noticed LaMotta as the boxing gym was near a store where her father worked as a butcher. But her experiences with men were violent. Her father was a small-time gambler who went into alcoholic rages and beat her. At the age of 15, she had went out with a gangster who raped her. But she was immediately attracted to LaMotta as he came across as protective, but low-key, likening him to John Garfield in the movie Body and Soul. LaMotta himself was smitten when he first saw Vicky at the neighborhood pool, thinking also that she looked like something straight out of the movies. She was 16, he was 24. They were married in 1946, three months after their initial meeting, mostly because she had become pregnant. LaMotta was a jealous man and it only increased during his marriage with beauty queen Vicky. In his delusion, he imagined that numerous men, his neighbors, friends, and even his brother were seeing his wife intimately. He forbade Vicky from talking to other men. Even the local grocer and butcher were off limits. He beat her on occasion, which would be followed by makeup sessions of apologies and gifts. While I was training, LaMotta said, I'd refrain from having sex. It worked for me. It made an animal out of me. But here I was married to a young, beautiful lady. She's like anybody else, needs fulfillment. I was obsessed, going out of my mind. Vicky often talked about how LaMotta started drinking and therefore lost his ability to be a fighter. The more he drank, the more violent he became, and the beating started. Vicky thought it best to prevent anything that made him agitated. I was not supposed to think, Vicky said. I was supposed to be obedient. LaMotta's frustration in his married life carried over into his boxing career. I was uncrowned champion for five years, LaMotta said. I was the number one contender. Nobody wanted to fight me. I had nobody managing me. I managed myself. I didn't trust nobody. I wanted to do it myself. LaMotta hated the fact that Robinson had gotten his crack at a belt, but he had not. After suffering a decision loss to journeyman Cecil Hudson, LaMotta's confidence cracked. His brother Joey suggested that it was time to meet some mobsters if he ever wanted a shot at the title. A now desperate LaMotta agreed, and a deal was struck. LaMotta would get his title shot, but first he had to take a dive against a fighter named Billy Fox. Fox had a glossy record of 43 wins and one loss, but the consensus was that LaMotta would be too much for him. Just hours before the fight, the odds miraculously changed. Fox suddenly became the betting favorite. There was so much unusual action on Fox that the bookies began only taking bets on LaMotta to win. The fight itself showed LaMotta looking like his old self in round one, but in rounds two and three, he began absorbing power shots from Fox and not returning fire. His knees began buckling and the majority of the audience thought he was playing possum. Fox pounded LaMotta with numerous lefts and rights, snapping his head back. There were shouts to stop the fight and the referee finally intervened, stopping the contest in the fourth round. Members of the New York State Athletic Commission pushed aside the press to get to LaMotta's locker room, questioning him about his lackluster performance. LaMotta pointed to the fact that Fox was a good fighter, stating that, quote, it just wasn't my night. But then he changed his story to the fact that he had an injured spleen and kept quiet about it. The commission withheld his purse and suspended him for seven months for hiding the injury. LaMotta later admitted years later that he threw the fight on orders from Frankie Carbo. But during this time, he suffered emotionally during the suspension, hoarding the secret because he wanted a shot at the middleweight title. His brother Joey then received the okay from Carbo. A match against champion Marcel Serdan was in the works, but LaMotta had to keep winning. I'm not trying to whitewash myself, LaMotta said later. I was a thief. I threw a fight. But those rats who run boxing make me look like a little Lord Fauntleroy. LaMotta fought and won five times in 1948, winning a close decision over Tommy Yaros. He started out in 1949 with a loss to Laurent Dothiel in Montreal. But the mob kept their word for a fight with Marcel Serdan, but they now demanded $20,000 as a matchmaker's fee. Jake had Vicky pawn her engagement ring to get the money. The extortion fee was now paid, and the fight was on. LaMotta locked Serdan in a clinch in the first round. 
and when he shoved Sedan off, the defending champion landed on his shoulder, injuring it, and he fought with this disadvantage throughout the fight. Lamada's wife Vicky was ringside and watched him fight for the first time. It was a thing of beauty to watch, Vicky said. Shadan was exhausted after seven rounds and his cornerman wanted him to quit. The defending champion refused, but only temporarily as he could not answer the bell for the tenth round. Jake Lamada was now the middleweight champion of the world. Heavyweight champion Joe Lewis handed him the specially designed belt made of gold, sapphires, and rubies. Lamada looked down on his prize and his eyes watered. The thing I wanted most was the championship of the world. That was the whole point of my life, Lamada said. After I got it, it destroyed me. I didn't realize that until later. A rematch was made with Serdan, but he died in a plane crash as he made his way to the States for the last leg of his training camp. Lamada lost to Robert Villamain in a non-title match before taking five fights in 1950. Never a fighter to duck anyone, he would take on former conqueror Laurent Dothiel in a rematch. And once again, Dothiel troubled Lamada, hopelessly behind on the scorecards. Lamada had to score a knockout to retain his championship. Negotiations then began for a sixth bout with Sugar Ray Robinson. Robinson wanted LaMotta's middleweight belt. LaMotta wanted Robinson's image, refined and respectable. The fight was scheduled for Valentine's Day of 1951 and would be televised around the world. The casual fan would now be able to see what boxing's most intense rivalry looked like. During the press tour, Robinson wasted no time in trying to get into LaMotta's head. At a luncheon in Chicago, Robinson ordered a cup of blood from a raw steak. He offered a sip to LaMotta, but the champion refused. Meanwhile, LaMotta continued his weight struggle, coming in four and a half pounds over the 160 pound limit a day before the bout. His trainer sneaked him into a steam room and over four hours later, finally let him out. The pressure was on. Over one fifth of the country would be tuning in to watch the bout on television. In the locker room, LaMotta ordered a shot of brandy, gulping it down before making his ring walk.
LaMotta took 56 straight flush shots but refused to go down in an event forever known as the St. Valentine's Day Massacre. Members of the mainstream press weren't enamored with the savagery of the fight. The Indianapolis News had a front page editorial stating that the fight was, quote, a sickening tribute to brutality and a throwback to the Cro-Magnon man. LaMotta ballooned up in weight after the defeat. He claimed he indulged his appetite as a man because he had gone hungry too many nights as a boy. He would weigh 175 pounds for a bout against light heavyweight Bob Murphy, fighting like a shell of his former self. His cornerman told ringside physician Vincent Nardiello to stop the fight. He can quit, the doctor said, but I won't stop it. LaMotta didn't get off his stool for the eighth round. Writers now all agreed that LaMotta was showing the strain of over 12 years of fighting as he struggled with Eugene Hairston and Norman Hayes in his next bouts. After being floored for the first time in his career by former Marine Danny Nardico, LaMotta once again quit on a stool and then quit boxing. Returning over a year later, LaMotta would retire for good after losing a decision to Billy Kilgore in April of 1954. I'm tired, LaMotta said. I'm through making excuses to myself. I haven't had any pep. I've been telling myself it's the weather and I've been working too hard, but it's time to quit and nobody knows it better than I do. LaMotta struggled with finding worthwhile endeavors after his boxing career ended. He would be barred from managing fighters after it was disclosed that he was Jackie Labua's undercover manager, even though LaMotta didn't have a license. He wanted to join a band and tried playing the trumpet with embarrassing results. He tried acting, starting in the theater, and later getting bit parts in movies. Now living in Miami, he opened a nightclub called Jake LaMotta's Lounge. Buddy Hackett and Milton Burl made appearances, but the clan's hell quickly went from elite to lowlife. LaMotta would bring home riffraff that he'd meet at the bar, which became the final straw for his wife Vicky as she divorced him. LaMotta was then arrested for violating Florida's prostitution law as a 14-year-old girl told police she plied her trade at his bar. The girl testified that LaMotta kissed her to, quote, determine her age and that she must be over 21 to kiss that way. LaMotta then found her a date with a friend for whom she was paid $20 to have sex with. The girl told police that LaMotta instructed her on how to succeed as a prostitute by telling her, quote, how to act, how to dress, and what to say to prospective customers. LaMotta was sentenced to six months hard labor. So here I was at 35, back where I was at 15, in the can, LaMotta said. His anger remained the same as well, as he quickly became a discipline problem, being thrown into solitary confinement, incensed that he was taunted by staff and other prisoners. Here I was back in a box, LaMotta said. Seven by seven by three, no bed, just a blanket on the floor, nowhere to go but up. Upon his release, LaMotta was seen as finished as a businessman. He entertained the thought of coming back to the ring. I'll work out and decide if I still have it, LaMotta said, having lost 57 pounds while doing hard labor in the Florida sun for six months. LaMotta remarried and divorced again. In 1960, he appeared at a Senate hearing to discuss the 1947 fight fix against Billy Fox. But his now former wife Vicky believed that it wasn't the Fox fight that ruined LaMotta, it was the Robinson fights. Physically and psychologically, Vicky said, Sugar Ray Robinson destroyed him. Jake was never the same in or out of the ring again. LaMotta lost the $2 million he earned as a fighter as his nightclub bled money. He got by on odd jobs doing after-dinner speaking more bit parts in movies and doing stand-up comedy, but he could not avoid bad company, which led to him being interrogated about the unsolved murder of financier Maitland Brenhaus, of which he was cleared of being a suspect. In 1967, LaMotta selected his fourth bride, Colleen Farrington, a Playboy playmate and mother of future movie actress Diane Lane. My other three wives were all former beauty queens and still in their teens, the now 45-year-old LaMotta said, Colleen's a former beauty queen too, but she's an old gal of 27. This go-around, Jake's engagement to the beauty queen lasted only 10 minutes, as Farrington, quote, 
had her fill of the lower depths. She then sued LaMotta for the expense of their engagement party. In 1973, LaMotta had, quote, come to the defense of young American womanhood as he found work as a bouncer in a topless bar. But his luck changed as Hollywood purchased the rights to his memoir and made a movie about his life. Robert De Niro would win an Academy Award for his portrayal of LaMotta in Raging Bull. The critics raved and LaMotta was once again back in the spotlight, an older and more mellow version of himself. I decided I wasn't mad at anybody, LaMotta said. It's like when you hurt for a long time and then all of a sudden you get lucky and you forget the pain. Well, I forgot my pain. But tragedy would strike twice in 1998 as his oldest son, Jake Jr., would die of liver cancer in February of that year. His youngest son, Joseph, died in September in the crash of Swiss Air Flight 111. During his senior years, LaMotta remained active with speaking and autograph tours. He married for the seventh and final time in 2013. In 2017, LaMotta died from complications of pneumonia at the age of 95. You only live once, LaMotta said, but if you work it right, once is enough.